turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 11 to the end of the chapter. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who will force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Our Father, we pray that your word would speak to us clearly today. We want to be prepared in our souls for this participation in the Lord's table. We want to honor our Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask that you would help us and that you would draw near to us our God and that you would cause us to understand what we need to know from this portion of your word. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. These closing words of the Apostle Paul to the Galatian churches could be described as his final salvo. If we think of this letter as a barrage of gunfire, these would be the last shots. Now that seems to be a strange way to describe an apostolic letter. <coughs> But I believe it's accurate, for Paul was in a battle, a great battle, seeking to recover these churches to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. These people that he was writing to, scattered throughout the Galatian region, were very dear to Paul. Many of them had been converted during his first missionary journey and gathered together into fledgling churches. But as we know, they had been infiltrated by false teachers, men that we call Judaizers, because they were saying, it's okay to believe in Christ, but along with that, you've got to add obedience to the old covenant ceremonial law. And their particular focus was an insistence on circumcision. So we could characterize their teaching this way. It's okay to believe in Jesus, but you also need to be circumcised. That's the only way to be accepted by God. This was a dangerous departure from the true gospel, and Paul knew it. And that's why at the beginning of the letter, we might say his opening gunshots were the pronouncement of the strongest curse on anyone who preached another gospel. And he actually repeated that curse twice. Just think of that. An apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ was saying that anyone who adds or takes away from the biblical gospel is on their way to hell to experience God's wrath for all eternity. It's no little issue that Paul was addressing. 
So in these concluding statements, he gives a summary. In essence, he's saying, these men who've made their way into your midst aren't really interested in you. They're not really concerned about their salvation, your salvation. They're just using you. They want to be able to go around and boast that they have won you over to their way of thinking. And that would be a means whereby they could escape the persecution from the broader Jewish population in the area. Now in contrast to these men and their false teaching, the Apostle Paul makes this incredible declaration in verse 14. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, we want to use this declaration of Paul as we get ready to come to the Lord's table. As we listen to Paul, may it be an affirmation that we are all prepared to make. May it come from our hearts with the same kind of spiritual strength that reverberated from the Apostle Paul's heart. So we begin, first of all, this morning by asking the question, what does it mean to boast in Jesus Christ? What does it mean to boast in Jesus Christ? This word that Paul used here, to boast, or sometimes it's translated in the older translations, to glory, pretty common word even in our day and not hard to define. It means essentially to take great pride in something and be willing to tell everybody about it. Pretty simple. Take pride in something and tell everyone about it. It would be like the father who boasts in the accomplishments of his son playing hockey. He's got great pride. He's going around telling people, did you see that shot? Did you see how he outmaneuvered the other team members? And he's going around and he's telling everybody about it. This pride and the resultant bragging speaks of a confidence. This is what my son is able to do. Now in verse 13, Paul says that this is what the Judaizers were doing. They were boasting in the flesh of the Galatians. Look at what we've been able to do, they would say. We've persuaded these Christians to go under the knife. Now they're really saved. And so they were boasting in their physical achievements. They were confident that these Galatian Christians would now really be accepted by God. And so they were putting their confidence in the flesh and boasting in it. In stark contrast, Paul affirmed that he would never boast like that. But far be it from me. May I never boast in physical accomplishments as though I had been the one able to save people. May I never take pride in what I have done as a messenger of Jesus Christ. May my only boast be this, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul would say, that's where my confidence lies. I know that what Christ accomplished in his suffering and death, that's the only thing that can save any person. It's only Jesus and his work on the cross that can bring the forgiveness of sins. It's only through the cross that a person can be right with God. Now, that's what it means to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. First of all, to have a deep-seated confidence of what Christ accomplished through his suffering and death. And secondly, to be ready to tell other people about that glorious message. If you come to Christ, you can have the same benefits. And that's exactly what Paul did. Everywhere he went, he boasted in Christ and his cross. 
when it was convenient and when it wasn't convenient. He boasted in Jesus Christ. Whether he was standing in front of a crowd of eager listeners or whether he was standing on trial for his own missionary labors, he told people about the Lord Jesus and urged them to believe in Christ and his cross as the only way to be saved. He assured people that if they would call on the name of the Lord, Christ would save them. Paul put it this way when he reminded the Corinthian church of his mission to them. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so Paul almost could picture in his mind going for the first time into that city of Corinth, that great metropolis teeming with people uh, of Greek background. And Paul says, when I, I looked at myself, I, I was full of fear, trembling. This task was too great for me. I knew I couldn't save anyone. These people so committed to lives of sin, lives of self, lives of false religion. I wasn't going to change anybody's mind. But he was confident that in the proclamation of Christ and his cross, God could save many people. That's why he boasted in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, because there and there only, is God, God's means of saving sinners. So why, what does it mean to boast in the cross of Christ? Well, it's to be confident in Christ and in his work and be willing to tell other people. That leads us to a second question, and we'll spend the rest of our time here. Why should we boast in the cross of Christ? Why should we boast in the cross of Christ. Well, as we think about boasting, we're thinking about taking deep pride in something and having confidence in something with an eagerness to tell others. So why should we boast in Christ and his cross? Well, two reasons for us to consider. First of all, the Lord Jesus is the most glorious person. The Lord Jesus is the most glorious person. Now, I think we'd all have to acknowledge there are many fascinating people in this world. Perhaps there are some people that you would like to meet. Just, you see them from afar, you see them on TV or whatever. They're obviously fascinating people. Maybe they're people in politics or sports heroes or famous people that you would like to know. Uh, I would always have liked to have met our late queen. Lots of people like that, you just think, wow, they're, they're great people. There's something about them that is so attractive. And I'm sure you know other people, people of your acquaintance, who from the world's standard would be common people. They're not famous people. Uh, perhaps they're family members of yours. But they're just amazing people to be around. You love to be around them. Um, they're, they're wonderful people. You're very thankful for the privilege of knowing them. But when we begin to study the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize that there is no one like him. No one who has walked on this earth even holds a candle to how wonderful and glorious our Lord Jesus is. And as we read the Gospels, you know that the story begins with his birth, and that in and of itself is fascinating. Though it's so familiar, it never grows old. 
And to think that the story of the birth of Christ in Bethlehem is the record of the Son of God who existed from all eternity and yet he was willing to come into this world to take humanity into himself to become the God-man, although his deity was mostly veiled by his humanity. The Gospel writers tell us that in writing their accounts of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus, they had to be selective in their choice of material because there was just so much to tell about Jesus. John, in fact, concludes his Gospel by telling us that if everything about Jesus was written down, the world would be filled with volumes. That's a fascinating life. So we know that Jesus could heal lepers. He could feed thousands of people. He could walk on the water. He could raise people from the dead. And so we wonder, what other signs did Jesus perform that weren't written down in the Gospels because there wasn't enough space? His preaching was spellbinding. This past year, Pastors Conference, as part of the exhortation from Scripture, was about preaching. Someone made the comment, Spurgeon's called the Prince of Preachers, and they said, really, Jesus was the Prince of Preachers. Was, he, he was the best preacher. What would it have been like to sit and listen to Jesus? The people listened with amazement and glorified God for the things that he was telling them. And as we study through the Gospels, we really only have snippets of what he said. What if we had a whole audio library of all the sermons of our Lord Jesus Christ? And to know that this Savior, this glorious, fascinating Savior, was eager to be with people. He accepted dinner invitations from his enemies because he wanted opportunities to tell the gospel to them. He attended receptions where the crowds were filled with notorious sinners and they were attracted to him. He was willing to spend time with the outcasts of society. He gladly took babies in his arms. He preached to thousands any dialogue with individuals. Jesus wouldn't turn anyone away who came to him. And to think that now, as Jesus is in heaven, glorified at his Father's right hand, seated on the throne of the universe, ruling over all things to work out the eternal plan of God, and he's still willing to have a relationship He's still concerned about us every day. He's still willing to, to, to uh, listen to us and to answer our prayers and how the gospel invites us to come to him for eternal life. We ought to boast in Christ and his cross because Jesus is the most wonderful person. But then secondly, the Lord Jesus has accomplished the most glorious work. Again, we acknowledge that many people have accomplished great things in the course of this world. Maybe someone that you know never got below an, an, an A on their tests and exams. They, they ace everything. Other people are more skilled with their hands and it's amazing to see what they can build when we see the advances that have been made in our day in science and technology and medicine, we recognize that people can accomplish some pretty amazing things. But no one begins to compare with our Lord Jesus and what he accomplished by his life and death. Because our Lord Jesus, by his life and death, rescued people from hell and brings them to heaven. 
That's a work. There's no other work to compare with that. Our Lord, we know, accumulated a record of a perfect life. He obeyed God in everything. He never sinned. In every thought, word, and action, he was doing the will of God. No other person has even come close to that. You know that despite his perfections, he was deeply hated. In fact, his perfection stirred up other people because his perfections showed up their sins. And so they heaped abuse on him whenever they could. They tried many times to put him to death until they finally chased him all the way to the cross. We know the records that the gospel writers give to us of his sufferings and death, the awful torments that he endured, the hours of agony upon the cross. And we know that he did this willingly. He gave himself to his abusers because he knows, knew that there was something more significant going on than the attacks of evil men. God was using all of this evil to accomplish something good. God had actually ordained this suffering of Jesus that he might be the savior for many people. Jesus, by his suffering and death, was paying for sin and winning acceptance with God for other people who don't deserve it on their own. In the gospel that is offered to us, Jesus offers his perfect record of righteousness, the obedience that God's law demands to be accepted into heaven. In other words, Jesus' work can save people from hell and get them into heaven. God is willing to accept Jesus' payment, his perfect record of righteousness and his suffering on the cross. God is willing to take that for us. So Jesus, by his work, can change our lives and make us children of God. One day, all of the great things that men have accomplished, all of the great inventions, will lie in the dustbin of history. But the work of Jesus will go on forever. There will be people gathered around the throne of God, praising the Lamb who was slain, because he has given them the greatest gift of all, salvation. This is the glorious work of Christ. Now here is a Savior to boast about. You remember when Peter and John, in the early days of the church in Jerusalem, were, uh, uh, were arrested because they had performed a great miracle on a lame man, and as a result, preached to many people about the Lord Jesus. They're arrested, they're brought in before the Sanhedrin, they're told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. But Peter did essentially what Paul's doing here. Peter said in Acts 4, 12, this, or 11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's Peter, and he's telling these religious leaders the only way to be saved is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you men, thinking you're following all of God's rules, making up more rules, trying to tell other people how to live to please God, you've missed it because it's Christ and his cross. Now that's confidence and that's boasting. Peter knew he might lose his head for that. He didn't care. He might as well have said with Paul, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a savior to have confidence in. The most glorious person who has performed the most glorious work. And so as we come to the table this morning, 
most important next question is, is this Savior your Savior? Is this glorious person, Jesus Christ, is this glorious work that he's accomplished, is it yours? Because that's what salvation is. Salvation is essentially knowing a person. It's knowing Jesus Christ. It's coming to him and asking him, Savior, I want to be yours. I want you to clean up my life. I want you to take away my sins. I want you to give me this gift you've promised, the gift of eternal life. I want to know you. So do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that gives you a confidence and a readiness to tell other people you need to trust in Christ too. He is the only person who can save you. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for both his person and work. We pray that you would cause us to grow in amazement when we consider the Lord Jesus. May we be willing to think about him, to spend time thinking about him, meditating on him, meditating on who he is, thinking about what he has done. Oh, our God, please work this in our hearts. Intellectually, we know all about the Lord Jesus. How often is our relationship poor and meager? So we ask that through the means of your word and your spirit, we might be drawn more and more to the Lord Jesus. And even as we participate in this table, may we remember Christ and think on him. Help us, Holy Spirit, you who have been sent to put a spotlight on the Lord Jesus. Please do that for us today. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen.